I'm really, really happy and excited uh, to be introducing this event um, today. It's very rare to have a kind of perfect intersection between colleagues uh, that one admires, uh, friends, uh, and great, fantastic architects and designers, uh, alumni, uh, and a really interesting city uh, that has been the site of architecture, arch architectural and urban experimentation uh, now for, um, for at least uh, two decades. And to be in particular introducing uh, one of the people who enabled that city to become such a site of architectural um, experimentation, uh, 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 Terence Riley, um, who is a, who's a GSAP alum, uh, who's a fantastic um, architect and one of the, probably one of the most influential uh, sort of curators and critics that have, uh, you know, kind of practiced um, uh, in the U.S. and internationally um, over uh, a few decades, <laughs> five years, three years, a few decades. I think that uh, um, Terry is uh, started his I, I, his curating practice at Ross Gallery, actually, um, mm -hmm. where uh, I remember uh, once I was having a coffee with Bernard Chumi, and Bernard said, "You know, Ross is so important. Look at you know, look at what 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 Terry, Terry did after after curating great shows and and, and here at the school." Uh, and uh, after Ross, uh, Terry served as the Philip Johnston Chief Creator for Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art from 91 and 2006. Um, not obvious to have a practicing architect uh, in that role, and, and, and Terry certainly shaped uh, um, uh, MoMA and architecture at that time. Uh, I remember personally seeing the light construction show, uh, which was quite influential at the time. I was studying at McGill and kind of always coming to New York to get sort of higher level <laughs> architecture, and that show was really influential on me personally, but also um, the show on the emerging uh, uh, in institute and in the Spanish uh, emerging scene, and so many, so many. Uh, you know, and, and also so many incredible shows on Rampool House, and you know, really featuring um, architects as they were emerging. And then from 2006 to 2010, he was the director of the Paris Art Museum in Miami, uh, and led uh, the institution through its transformative uh, uh, transfer planning and design with you know incredible now new building designed by Herzog and Limerow, and again. Uh, I think the ability for someone to be, uh, you know, as an architect, uh, occupy these various roles, uh, practice architecture, curate architecture, but also commission architecture, um, I think is incredibly unique and an inspiration and a model for us here at the school, where we think about architecture as a kind of uh, expanded practice, as a way to look at the world to, uh, uh, and to kind of give it shape. Um, and so today, Terry will focus specifically on, on Miami as a project uh, in itself and the design district in particular and how uh, um, through shaping uh, ideas about that city, uh, um, he uh, enabled a number of emerging uh, architects to really you know, build uh, and, and experiment uh, and have the kind of freedom that uh, we're always kind of um, looking for. So, Please join me in welcoming back Terence Riley. Uh, aside from uh, the design district, which has been a project that has been in development, I would say, for about 12 years or 15 years, a single developer trying to turn around a, uh, a neighborhood that was a bit down at the heels. Um, and the arrival of Art, Art Basel, the, uh, a very broad sort of rethinking in architecture didn't really, hadn't really occurred yet. Uh, in, I think it was eight years ago, <clears throat> I wrote an article for the Miami Rail, which is the Brooklyn Rail's cousin, uh, and it, 
It was based on uh, the growing uh, agreements between uh, extremely well-known international architects and uh, Miami developers. And this was not the status quo, absolutely not the status quo. Uh, and that's uh, Zaha's building a uh, 1,000 Park. Uh, the development of Miami and the relationship to its architecture uh, was more traditionally uh, done by developers, uh, George Merritt uh, being one of them. Uh, he invented this town called Coral Gables, and his company would provide imagery like this and, and make this suggestion that this kind of American dream for a castle in Spain could be an actuality. I mean, this became, <coughs> Coral Gables became the sort of historic Mediterranean counterpoint to another fantasy, which was fastly growing on the beach. And that was this sort of deco, international style, uh, glitzy, uh, whatever you might want to call it, Tel Aviv, uh, Rio, um, etc. Um, so this was totally unprecedented, really. And it didn't stop with Zaha. Uh, this is uh, two towers by Bjork Engels in Coconut Grove. And it just has begun, I mean, one of the big questions I had in the book, is this a real love affair or is this going to be a, a terrible date? Is this going to be a, uh, and I, I would have to say that the architects have done a, a really good job, I think, of educating the developers. Um, the building here is Herzog de Miron again, and by kind of embedding their orthogonal plan inside a diagonal volume, it helps, it helps them generate this, uh, uh, this skin that, you know, is, from a distance it might look like a, just a, a monolith, but it's got a very, very attractive skin in that sense. OMAs, <clears throat> also in Coconut Grove. Caesar Pelli, um, on in a place called Surfside. Uh, and it isn't just the condos. Uh, this is Frank Gehry's New World Symphony building. Everything that you usually think of being Gehry-esque is actually inside the building. And the uh, wall on the left is called the projection wall, and its function, it's a very small orchestral academy. There's only 750 seats. So when they're having their practices, their uh, rehearsals, uh, they can be projected on the outside for a broader audience. Uh, uh, this amazing parking structure uh, by Herzog and de Muron which is actually turned into a kind of community space uh, for events. And of course, my favorite project, the one I worked on, uh, the Herzog and Muron Design Museum, uh, renamed the Paris Art Museum. And uh, I think it really shows how talented they are. Um, what does all this mean? Uh, I think a couple things are at play here. Um, one is, I think the developers realized, you know, there, were, there, was, there used to be a certain formula which had to do with the size of the building, its location on the waterfront, and a few other factors. Um, more and more, especially like, for instance, uh, Uh, Zaha's building. Zaha's building is not on the water. Uh, it's on a park that overlooks the water, but it isn't got that cachet. And uh, without that kind of cachet, 
a lot of Miami developers were producing the same product everywhere. You know, and all they could do is sort of come up with different names. And I do believe that has been the thing that really caused uh, Miami to, to look <coughs> outward. And I think with some, some pretty good commercial success. The, um, I think another aspect is, is that as the public architecture, like Gary's building, like the museums, uh, improve, the, uh, the taste for good architecture is actually expanded. And I think finally, this last blast of, of, of towers uh, were made not for retirement so much as targeting very wealthy uh, people from uh, the United States, but also around the world. And I think that the lack of, shall we say, uh, the, the typical uh, Miami developer project was lacking in a certain kind of cachet that they were looking for. Now, I can't show, it would take such a long time to uh, illustrate what's been going on in the design district, but it's this, it's this roughly four blocks uh, uh, with a pedestrian uh, axis running north-south to you. And uh, the number of artists working there, Randa Lash, Clavel Architectos, Jürgen Meyer, Su Fujimoto, Work AC, Salva Witt, Iwamoto Scott, Ten Architectos, Buru, Buru Lech Brothers, Zahadid, Buckminster Fuller, Leon Leon, Leon Mark Newsom, Orangarin, and Gallegos, Konstantin Gricic, ourselves, KR, MOS, Patrick, Patricia Urquiola, John Bandos, John Bandos, sorry, and Johnston Markley is just really, really um, incredible. And I, I'm going to encourage you to go to their um, websites, either the, the design district's website or to, um, to look at the individual sites. So, I think it's my time to let other people show and tell. And the first uh, duo is going to be Gustavo Berenbloom and Claudia Bush. They're founding principals at Berenbloom Bush Architects in Miami and graduates of the Advanced Architectural Design Program at the GSAPP. They're recognized as design leaders in maritime transportation architecture, having planned and designed cruise terminals in the US, Europe, Central America, Japan, and China. The firm's practice also extends to education, corporate hospitality, residential interior design, and master planning. They have worked on projects with Herzog and Vignon, Zaha Hadid, Werner Schumi. In addition to their practice, Claudia teaches architecture at FIU, uh, Florida International University, where she holds the position of senior instructor at the College of Architecture and the Arts. And Gustavo serves as co-chair of FIU's Dean's Leadership Advisory Group. I want to thank Amal and, uh, and Mia here with this sexy image uh, for inviting us and bringing us home. We wanted um, to bring some sun here actually, <laughs> because we flew in yesterday from Miami. And uh, we graduated a long time ago from Miami. And but we, we went here in New York and we went to Miami and it was quite a shock at the beginning. So, so something of that you certainly experienced there. And uh, maybe, maybe most of you guys uh, who were born in the 90s do not remember this image. This is kind of like foreign to you, but this was called Miami Vice in the 80s and it was like uh, a series that ran for many years. And I think this captured the imagination and uh, uh, as this image of Miami as a beautiful people, tan, showing their bodies, smiling, happy, with the seagulls and the sea behind. And even though we've become, I want to think that we've become a little bit more sophisticated and elegant, <laughs> if you scratch a little bit the surface, the surface this is still what you get. <laughs>
Um, so this is the view from Miami, Miami Beach. Um, it's an incredible exuberant place uh, surrounded by the Caribbean, the water. Um, it's, you wonder what is Miami's identity. Uh, it's probably half Cuban, a quarter Brazilian, um, a sixth American. And all of this, depending where you drive, where you are at any given moment, this, this thing is ever changing. You are finding yourself submerged or immersed into these different cultures um, and which, which are being made and questioned as we speak. It's an evolving question, what is Miami? And what is the limit of, of the US, where the US starts? Many people think that the US finishes in Fort Lauderdale. This is not the way it is. Um, we think it's the future of the US. If we can resolve the question of Miami, we are resolving bigger questions for what America should be. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and maybe that's for another conversation. But if you look at a map of Miami, right, and it's all, all, all on our side, and the image is water, and you see the development uh, that occurs, that is here in this kind of fuchsia color identified, has been happening in the coast, you know, mostly. And um, lately, uh, it has been moving inland. But Terry was talking about the design district for a second in this last image that he showed, and maybe Claudia can show you where that is in the map of Miami. We are going to show you today, actually, a couple of projects in Wynwood, and one in downtown. I know that the poster said build work, but we're going to show you more uh, projects that are in the making um, for this short presentation. So we're going to focus first on the project in Wynwood. Um, Wynwood actually, um, hmm, that's an interesting slide. Wynwood actually was an area that um, was taken by uh, Tony Goldman. Uh, here from the U.S. and um, it's low-lying, uh, surrounded by uh, warehouses. And Tony came here from from New York, bought, bought a bunch of artist uh, studios and, and, and warehouses, and started transforming the facade uh, of, of these places. And um, we were giving a project which is a massive project for the area, completely out of scale with the surrounding, because it's like a 250,000 square feet. So we had to deal with this big scale in this uh, low scale surrounding. And part of the uh, questioning, part of what we've tried to do is dematerialize this facade fronting the street and actually dealing with the surface, which is this one millimeter uh, of, of, of surface that, that, that is the facade that, that fronts uh, Fifth Avenue and 25th Street. Um, so, Right, because actually, unfortunately, one of our slides is missing, but all of the area here in, in Wynmode, all these warehouses, when, if you look, were transformed using graffiti into a totally new neighborhood. Actually, if you hashtag Wynmode, there are 2.5 million hashtags, you know, so people, it has become the new tourist center of Miami, where people go, uh, to to see these murals and, and you know it has been centrified now there as restaurants and bars like that so this idea of uh, transforming the facade we also used uh, and incorporate in our design so uh, this is Wynwood uh, Terry was talking about design district it's important to note that this is kind of like Williamsburg and, and, and then you have whatever Dumbo and, and other areas and, and, and these are being developed as we speak in parallel, right? Um, in this project, again, it's, it's very large and includes a hotel, includes a, an academy uh, for a beauty product company and include offices and so forth. And, um, and it's, it's on the works now uh, to be completed uh, very soon. Again, we sent a, another presentation that I think it didn't come to this one. So you're going to see a mix of images uh, like this one that we have corrected. So you see it in our presentation, but it doesn't matter. Not it's good that we're home. Maybe that's the question, you know? Like, so one of the amazing things of Miami is the subtropical landscape. I mean the nature and, and the sun. So it is something that we have and that we like to work with. Two blocks away.
piece of land that a developer came and asked us to do a retail project. And we were wondering, how do we take this massive uh, lot, create uh, this out, outdoor mall, infuse it with vegetation, and actually build it all with containers? Um, and so this is a project that is basically based on the container, container module and uh, that it takes a shape, a very industrial, that we think is in, in keeping with, with, uh, with Wynwood. So the idea was to create a landscape using the containers and then to cover it all with one roof to create one unified park and then we called it Mana Park. Uh, I think Bernard will be proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, Right, so, you know, to every sort of in-between spaces that is created between the roof and the containers to create an outdoor experience. Yeah, so it's interesting because we, we start with the module of the container and then by multiplication, addition and juxtaposition of this element, right, that is very industrial, how do we occupy space, make it viable for, for humans and retail and a vibrant space uh, for, for, for the inside. And, um, this is being built as we speak with these, again, sexy images of Miamians. <laughs> and uh, the, the third project we wanted to show you today ties back to Terry and, uh, and the Pan Museum. It's also one of our favorite buildings in Miami. It's a beautiful place and we were very fortunate to be asked by the operator of food and beverage to create an outdoor bar on the terrace. So the Terrace is actually covered by this roof and um, by also by the volumes. It's open, it faces the water, it's windy, it's, it's a beautiful place. So we created, um, with the idea we started that uh, we wanted um, an object in there. We want, didn't want to compete with the architecture, but sort of like a flying bag in, the, in this uh, beautiful outdoor terrace. Um, they also ask us that uh, this bar had to be movable, uh, you know, in case hurricane is coming or they have other events. So we started with the idea of um, first analyzing what is the typical bar. So we had, um, you know, like a counter. Then we created um, an advanced design by creating it into this idea of being this one sort of whole sort of more like an egg, and then with a shell for protection. Um, this had to be designed also to function completely as a bar with everything, um, with um, equipment and, um, and so like, you know, this is highly complex. And then we came to, it had to be modulated, so also in order during hurricane that it can be moved inside uh, the restaurant. And it took us a lot of time to actually design that, but this worked. And we initially we started working actually using 3D printer. And then we thought, okay, how do we build it? That was a big challenge for us. There was no technology. Uh, do you know, this is typical, interesting for architects, no? We sold this idea and uh, then we say, how the hell do we do this, right? And so we, 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 we end up uh, linking it with uh, MX3D in Amsterdam. They had this amazing uh, technology of printing in stainless steel. So they actually invented, I mean, it's amazing. They put, they use a robotic arm, they're welding the steel, and as the steel is welded, they're creating this 3D printed um, lines. Hmm. And, um, and it's in the Netherlands. We found them over the internet, thanks to that. Gave them a call, email, and said, okay, we're interested and we could collaborate. So this is also a new change in Miami, that it has, you know, the, the collaboration internationally, because before, you know, there's nobody who could fabricate uh, And then actually you had brave people who trusted us, right? Because we had no, no idea how to make this thing. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but look, look at the skin, right? How it's perfect. This by hand would have been impossible, right? The algorithm to calculate this thing and that every piece that can, can be placed together and look like one element is fascinating and it's always touched and finished by hand. Here is a module, if you can see, this is one of the pieces, right, that composes this huge shell. 
Um, and uh, so this is in, 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 uh, in Amsterdam before being shipped. Uh, we had to travel there a few times. And this is a short video um, of the making of the piece and installing it when it came to Miami. So it arrived uh, one week before Hurricane Irma hit Miami. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we left, you know, and so conveniently. We the left. interesting <laughs> thing, actually, we were tested right away whether it works. So I want to show you the picture. And it was in, they, they installed the whole thing in three hours. You know, it was all prefabricated, installed it. And then this is Hurricane Elma came, and then the chef from the restaurant sent us this picture, so it worked. You know, yeah, we were disassembled. <laughs> and and then it, a few sexy images, of course. And, I, and then you are happy in the sunshine now in Miami. Thank you very much. Benaranda is a founding partner, and Joaquin Bonifaz, who I have not met, so I'm sorry about saying your name wrong, is a senior architect at Aranda Lash, a New York and Tucson based design studio that designs buildings, installations, and furniture. Benjamin is also a graduate of the MR program at uh, GSAPP, where he stood out as a great student in my class on Mies. Uh, he has, uh, Randall Ash has received the United States Artist Award, Young Architects Award, Design and Vanguard Award, AD Innovators, and the Architectural League Emerging Forces Award. Their early projects are subject to the book Tooling. Randall Ash has also exhibited internationally in galleries, museums, design fairs, and biennials. Their work is a part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And they are now ready to show us their work. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, no description of our studio would be complete without uh, paying respects to the city of Miami. We, uh, we're, we're in New York and uh, Tucson, um, but all of our formative work uh, really got tested out in the city of Miami. Um, we, uh, we've had a relationship with Design Miami and with the Design District, and we're going to show some of those projects. Um, but I, I just want to say that we are really indebted to the people uh, and the organizations that we've worked with over the years in Miami. Um, and we thought, um, as a kind of, as a to sort of pay respect, we would show you how we grew as a practice uh, over 10 years in 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> with, with Miami, with, with Miami's help, and the, um, the enlightened citizens of Miami that, uh, that's, that supported us along the way. Um, so, uh, um, we, uh, we showed, our early work was, um, was shown in a gallery uh, that showed in Miami, in Design Miami, and this was like right at the beginning of the whole kind of Art Basel thing, 2007 and eight. And we were making work um, that you see. Um, and part of our, um, our, our, our as, as luck would have it, um, our first sale uh, of furniture uh, was this uh, cabinet. And, and this is a key actor in our, uh, in our story. Uh, this, this cabinet um, was sold to, um, to, uh, to Craig Robbins, who is the uh, developer that uh, that Terry um, uh, mentioned, and uh, the cabinet uh, is. Um, I mean, you can see it. It's 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 about how this uh, this logic um, turns a corner, and, and specifically how it turns this ninety degree corner. That's what we were interested in, and um, uh, and when it came time for. Um, for Craig Robbins to uh, select architects for this development he was working on, uh, he had this cabinet in his kitchen, um, and, uh, and 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 we were lucky enough to get a, to get a call. So so we thought we would, uh, we would we would think about that, like what is this cabinet about, and and how we can use that story to explain uh, just four projects really quickly from Miami. Uh, yeah. So these four projects. Um 
that, we, that we're going to go over um, can be reduced to a couple of elements. Um, uh, uh, first, on the on the on the right over there is the uh, event space. Uh, one of the first projects we did there, and it can be reduced to uh, two slabs. Uh, the one, the second from the uh, from the right uh, is the uh, Art Deco project. Uh, it's really about a corner. Uh, the one uh, second from the left is a uh, second event space, uh, and it's really about a ceiling. And the last uh, on the left here is a store we just finished, and it's really about some years. Uh, so the event space uh, is essentially uh, about two slabs uh, the sandwich the programmatic functions. Um, it's a multifunctional space uh, that's perched up, about, uh, up, up above the south plaza of the design district. Um, uh, it, it required a lot of flexibility in be, being an event space um, and with all the code constraints and the client requirements, it really focused our energy to, to design these uh, two slabs. Uh, we quickly kind of learned uh, that Miami is very familiar with building in concrete. Uh, its engineers and, and builders uh, really allowed us to, to, to have a really large cantilever. Um, and uh, these cantilevers um, really provided a, a campus uh, for, us to, for us to act on. And uh, when we decided to act on this campus, uh, we really looked back at Miami's history. Uh, and we were really inspired by uh, the, um, the tropical modernism of Miami. So we decided to use a, a form liner to really um, decorate the, the, these slabs. Um, and we managed uh, with, a, with, a, with a simple, really simple form liner uh, that, that almost, it was almost free uh, in terms of uh, the cost that it came in. Uh, we, we managed to make two tiles uh, that rotated, really created um, a nod to this era of, uh, of, uh, of you know, the trust of modern in Miami, but it had a, a, a twist that was, that was our own. Um, the second project uh, we call Art Deco, um, and it's really about a corner. Uh, again, we, we look back at Miami's history. In this case, it was more of the Art Deco of the, of the 20s through the 40s. Um, uh, uh, we were inspired by the pleats uh, in the Art Deco uh, architecture and fashion. And, uh, we really gave the facade this pleats uh, uh, to bring back the ornament of, uh, of the ornament of Miami's golden era. Uh, the facade was made. Uh, the facade. Uh, sorry. Yep. The, one of the one of the trickiest things to do uh, when we started to use these pleats was to go around the corner. Uh, it was one of the more challenging um, parts of the design and, and, and construction, and but, but we really. Uh, like, I mean, we really think that that actually came out to be uh, one of the most successful parts of the building. <coughs> the, the facade is done with, uh, uh, it's made with a DRC, DRC panels. Um, we're, we, we are, again, find them on the internet again. Uh, we find this uh, company uh, that in Texas that made the GFRC mostly for really traditional buildings like cornices and stuff. But uh, we managed to talk them into uh, really casting these panels and they used a, a really, really long, um, Form, uh, where they would spray the panels and, and basically dam the form in different ways to, to create the, uh, uh, the different panels of the building. Uh, and once, once it was inside, it went up really quick. Um, it was actually like, you know, our, our intention was to kind of hide the seams so you could, you, could, you could read it as a single surface and not really read the seams. Uh, and we did that through scattering some of the some of the seams and also inserting these new, these new seams, uh, these new uh, slots, uh, which became the lighting feature. Um, the lighting, uh, we collaborated with uh, Spirit and Major, and uh, it, it has this like sl very slow pulsating kind of feel uh, that really animates it uh, at night. Uh, you know, we've been back a bunch of times having other projects in Miami and, and having a lot of work on there. Um, and every time we go down there, we're really amazed by how um, the pleats interact with the really strong and warm Miami sun. And it really gives this like extraordinary depth uh, to a very thin, relatively thin facade. 
Um, this is the second event space uh, we did in Miami. Uh, this one's actually on the north uh, plaza of, of the design district. Um, and it really, uh, um, um, again, it had to be super flexible, super um, open. Um, so we really focused, again, on, on the ceiling in this case. Um, the ceiling is like a, a series of folded planes. Uh, and the, the planes kind of, uh, as they move up and down, they, they, make, they compress and decompress the space as you move through it uh, to give it a, a more unique character to the space. Uh, the, the event space is connected to the rest of the design district through this uh, antechamber uh, that's super dark uh, and it kind of uh, provides a relief as you come out into this very airy, very bright uh, space. Uh, between every fold, uh, there are these troughs that hide uh, all the mechanical equipment and all the hoisting equipment for the different spaces, for the different events, uh, when, when they have to like, hang laser trusses. Uh, the west facade, the west facade is completely operable and it opens up to this uh, uh, really lush uh, landscape designed by LPC. Uh, it really kind of, uh, the sense of the mature trees and the lush landscape really uh, makes you forget that you are in the third floor of, uh, of an urban building. So uh, over time we've, we've, um, um, we've worked on these projects, we've developed relationships down there, uh, we've uh, we show at this gallery called the Nina Johnson Gallery. Um, I actually think her, her, her program is um, one of the most exciting uh, in, in the country uh, right now for, for, for up and coming uh, artists and work. Um, and they, the, the galleries down there and the, there's the, and the culture in general is quite, um, it's quite open to design and, and positioning it um, uh, next to art, uh, sometimes to add art. Um, and uh, this is the last project we'll show, just really quickly, but the, the whole presentation um, um, from the cabinet to these event spaces and the, and the, uh, uh, the Art Deco project, it's all about uh, veneers, if you will, or, or, and, and that's what we've learned from Miami. It's like, how do you make something solid out of something thin, if you will? Uh, uh, you know, it's always about how you wrap a corner, how you really deal with this small space that the developer gives you on the edge of the building. And even this project, um, this is a, a store um, that we collaborated with BBA, with Gustavo and Claudia here uh, in, in Bell Harbor in Miami. It's also about veneers. Uh, it's for an Italian um, uh, fashion brand. They're from Milan. Uh, they, uh, they value their history. And so we looked at um, these uh, prototypical spaces in Milan, these entryways. Uh, of palazzos mainly, and really extracted this idea for how to deliver uh, and represent this brand, this store in, uh, in, in Miami. And it's through um, a lot of these, these surfaces that their, their kind of material richness comes out. It's, um, Belextra is, uh, it's amazing leather goods. They're highly refined, sophisticated materials. They're very understated um, in their, um, uh, in their in their um, in their branding, you don't see any logos or names on there. It's, and even the stitching is uh, is very minimal. Uh, and so, within this understatement, we decided to really create like a maximum uh, material effect a a around all that. And that material would all be uh, Milanese. It would all be this palazzo material, the marbles, uh, the stone on the facade, and the ground is, is a typical uh, street stone from Milan. Um, and uh, and the uh, the back wall is this um, is this Italian uh, sozzas uh, veneer, um, the Alpi uh, wood veneer. Um, one distinctive moment is this uh, thirty foot long coil that essentially organizes all the all the leather goods. Um, and this this project uh, is kind of our, our last project, and and uh, what we think is. Um, um, maybe how much or how far you can go uh, with something so thin. So that was our, that's our presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dominic Leong is a founding partner at uh, the studio with Leong Leong. He is an assistant adjunct professor at the GSAPP and a graduate of the school's advanced architectural design program. Leong Leong has completed a wide variety of projects, including the design, of U.S. Pavilion for the Venice Biennale in 2018, and he was previously 
the recipient of the Architectural League Prize. Dominic has also received recognition for his work that includes grants from the Rand Foundation and the New York State Council on the Arts. Dominic. Yeah, I mean, in the same way um, that Ben talked about, um, my has been pretty formative for our practice too. We were asked uh, 2014 to work on a project in Miami, a parking garage called City View Garage in the Miami Design District. Um, we also, you know, feel a lot of gratitude uh, to have this opportunity early in the practice. So it's, I think it's very commendable for the people involved in the design district to really push young architects. Um, so it's, uh, I think the slide that Terry showed highlighted the other um, garage, and I guess we bookend that. Um, so it's this um, black bar that sits right off the highway. And as everyone knows, um, the parking garage in Miami uh, sort of translates the infrastructure of parking into spectacle. And we uh, were fortunate to um, take a stab at that. And again, it's, it's, it is literally like what can you do with this thinness? I think what's fascinating about the design district is um, the transformation of the image of the, the district through this kind of thinness. Um, and so in this particular case, uh, we were commissioned by uh, DACRA developer uh, run by um, Craig Robbins. And it's more or less an exquisite corpse. Um, they asked uh, three ar or two architects to design uh, two thirds of the, the, fa uh, the facade. And in the middle um, is actually a John Baldessari piece, um, <coughs> which is hard to tell. And then it's super successful. And then Iwamoto Scott's on the, on the right, and then we're on the left. Um, and it, in, a, in a way, it's a pretty simple project. It's like, how do you skin this infrastructure and make it a kind of uh, urban icon that animates um, itself from the scale of the highway, but also from the neighborhood. So we were interested in that kind of scale shift. Um, and so how, how can we kind of generate some sort of skin that uh, creates a kind of atmospheric effect um, at the scale of the, the car and the highway? Um, we were really kind of inspired, um, what kind of Gustavo talked about, this, this sort of atmosphere of Miami. Um, so these kind of patterns of like water shimmering or the uh, kind of texture of palm trees um, taken almost very superficially. Um, but in a lot of ways, I don't, I don't think you always need complex ideas. It's more about how you execute them. Um, so in a way, it was how do we take this, this kind of ephemera of the atmosphere and translate it into a very executable skin design. Um, so we more or less uh, reduced the, the complexity of this texture, kind of water pattern down to like a series of shapes that created this pattern. Um, and then um, the desire to kind of create some depth within this thinness, essentially the 2D pattern gets kind of folded up into, uh, into like a 3D pattern. Um, and so from a distance, it's, it's, it's gold because it's in Miami. Um, we actually wanted to make it it's like super shiny, like mirror polish. Um, so we presented that to the client, and um, they said that's crazy because someone's going to be driving the car. They're going to crash. They're going to sue us, and then we're going to sue you. Um, <laughs> so we said, okay, that's that's totally fine. We can like you know make it less shiny, um, but we still get. Um, you know, these, these texts from uh, different people who are driving by and trying to kind of capture the, the glimmery effect. So I think it was successful in that regard. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's animated at these different scales from the scale of the car down to the scale of the neighborhood, the sidewalk. Um, and so what we really liked was how it actually gained the kind of texture or kind of roughness, almost even a kind of organic, crusty quality to it, like, like, like bark in a way. Um, the manufacturing or the fabrication process was pretty simple. It was um, uh, essentially flat packed stainless steel panels with a um, gold titanium coating on one side. So all the panels basically showed up in this crate. Um, and then on site, they were essentially uh, bent to create the, um, the dimensionality in the other direction. And it just so happens, it wasn't really intentional, but the um, the fins or the tabs actually uh, uh, work as like mini struts and they stiffen the panel. Um, so it prevents kind of oil canning in the panel. Um, and then you get this kind of like flip flopping on one side, it's uh, kind of raw stainless steel, and the other side has the gold. So 
depending on your vantage point, it's, it's kind of gets animated and, uh, as you move around the building. And then the inside is essentially becomes a kind of like cascade of shadows. And uh, I mean, one of the few kind of logistical requirements was maintaining a 50% porosity. So <coughs> it allows natural airflow. And um, also a lot of hurricane testing, um, which you know, wasn't, wasn't too difficult. Um, and then so at the scale of the kind of individual, individual aperture, you kind of get these views back, back to the city. That's it. <laughs> Hillary Sample is an associate professor, professor at JSAPP and a founding partner at MOS Architects. MOS was the recipient of the 2015 Cooper Ewitt Smithsonian Design. That's a long one. Smithsonian. <laughs> Let me say that again. <clears throat> Recipient of the 2015 Cooper Hewitt Smith Smithsonian Design Museum National Design Award in Architecture. Uh, the 2010 American Academy of Arts and Letters Architecture Award and the 2008 Architectural League of New York Emerging Voices Award. The firm has written numerous publications surveying their work and Hillary's design research on architecture and health has also been published in the books Imperfect Health, Canadian Center for Architecture, Lars Miller, 2012, and Maintenance Architecture, MIT Press, 2016. We're going to go through a lot of slides today. I think the project we were invited to do for the design district, it's, it's very small, probably the smallest one here of the group. Um, it's basically three feet wide, and that's a very small space to to think about designing. Um, and it's more about sort of setting the tone for the project and going through a series of things <coughs> along the way. This is a, a project that we worked on for about five years. Actually, it came in and out of the studio, sort of stopping and starting. Uh, so we were constantly reminded of Miami throughout all of these other projects we've been working on. Um, interestingly <coughs> enough, a former student of mine, um, Kurt Evans, uh, invited us to uh, work on the project. and. I had taught him, the last studio I taught him in was a studio that went to Montreal in February. So I think it's kind of fitting that he invited us to do something uh, in Miami. Uh, and part of, for those of you who know our work a little bit, um, we're always working on software and um, in relation to making buildings and objects. And so this is a proposal for something in Detroit. Um, I think we're also always working on projects that are remote from us in a way. So how to try to establish some sort of design ideas and relationship um, through our work, but also through potential placemaking. Um, so this is something we did for Venice, um, looking at some similar things that, again, um, this is done after we've been working on uh, Miami. So things like software, looking at shapes uh, in computer and processing, applying certain um, uh, sort of elements to it, like gravity, and sort of stopping those and making then a, an initial plan for a project, um, working on things like square windows. Uh, already in our, our, it's in our body of work, we are trying to work always with the same sort of elements over, sort of over and over again, kind of repeating those and playing with representation, making books, um, thinking about funny objects that we would really like to design but are, you know, say sort of, it's embarrassing to say you want to design a scented candle, um, working at the scale of say seating, vases, soap, uh, wood furniture, so another sort of soap dish, uh, funny hooks, uh, a shared bench, uh, rocks, um, things like this. We're also looking also at architects' drawings. Um, we've done a whole series on the figure, as well as, uh, in this case, model furniture is kind of the next project we have going on, but we're um, looking at the sort of incompleteness of that and then designing furniture around that through metal. We do a lot of work with metal. Um, and so, you know, just in the context of constantly working at different sizes, all relatively still small scale, everyone else here today is doing much bigger buildings than we are, and um, how to, you know, try to reinforce a practice that is engaged at a certain, at a certain scale, and, and wanting to keep the office, in a way, at that particular scale. So to reinvent um, the idea of a glass block, 
um, something that then is just connected very loosely, but through the design of the block. And I think for us, always being reminded of Miami, coming in and out of the office, that interesting relationship to design that architecture has that maybe it doesn't happen, I think, here in New York to the degree that it does in a place like Miami or um, maybe some a place also like, let's say, Mexico City, which I just got back from with, with my students and have been taking them there um, to look at housing. So this is for ADO, um, designing benches and jackets, um, designing an instruction manual in the form of a book with figures and stickers, and you know, just sort of setting ideas around where design and its intersection with architecture can come into play, a souvenir show that uh, story uh, critiquing also the American house, and this is a proposal for a you know, house for a small, a kind of small scale house. So again, always like um, trying to think about design and materials in relation to to the small scale and to materials. Um, and so, in the case of Miami, then as you can see, it's a really small, a really small project. Uh, no, at the time there's no client, uh, or sorry, there's no tenant, so we don't really even know what you're going to be looking at. Um, but through the process of, of writing software, um, applying these forces um, to produce a way into uh, finish the building, to, to produce an idea for the form. Uh, the facade is um, Danby marble, it's actually from Vermont. And it's, so it's much more durable. Again, kind of interest in maintenance, how to play that out through the practice without overtly stating that. And then simply freezing uh, the windows. There's 24 uh, windows and doors. They're all treated the same, uh, same size. It's roughly seven feet, which is typically the window size we're using in some of the house projects. It's recessed. I think that's you know the sort of one big move that everything is recessed as far back as we could possibly go. Uh, and then in, on the side, you can see some of the holes, which is where the lighting is. So um, also during that time, working on gallery chamber, um, where we again experimented with materials, thinking about marble in this way. Then we started to overlay the idea of milling and representation of lines in the materials. Um, to thinking about form that we don't have, let's say, in that project also, but always thinking about this idea of, of how deep something is, how to push more depth where possible. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll sort of end there, but just to say that the, you know, Miami, in this sort of five-year period, especially of moving and, and coming to New York, that we've been thinking about that in the context of all of the other projects. Um, and maybe the work doesn't necessarily reflect a Miami vibe, but that project has been very important for us in, in thinking about um, the work in general. So, thank you. Dan Wood is a former uh, employee of KR, <laughs> at the top of his, <laughs> his uh, resume. Uh, I think he was an intern before that. Since those days, <laughs> he has co-founded Work AC with Dean Amal Andreos, as well as being an adjunct associate professor at GSAPP and a graduate of the school's MR program. He leads international projects for Work AC, ranging from master plans to buildings across the U.S. as well as in Asia, Africa, and Europe. Wood held the 2013-14. <clears throat> Louis I. Kahn Chair at the Yale School of Architecture and has taught at Princeton, Cooper Union, and UC Berkeley, where he was the Frieden Distinguished Chair. Work AC had, was recently named the AIA New York State's Firm of the Year and has achieved international acclaim for projects such as the Master Plan for the New Holland Island Cultural Center in St. Petersburg, Russia, the Whedon Kennedy offices in New York, and the Edible Schoolyard at PS1 uh, 2016 in Brooklyn. Okay. All right, hi everybody. Last one, here we go. Uh, I came of age in the 1980s. Uh, and in 2016, Josh Jordan and I ran a studio uh, at Penn, which is another school. And um, we decided to look at Miami. And what was fascinating for us was to discover that uh, not only did I come of age in the 1980s, but Miami also came of age in the 1980s. Uh, and I think it's 
it's just, I, there are not many cities in the world that you could say that about. Um, and I think it's a, it's a kind of fascinating thing that we will be studying for, for centuries to come. Like the, you know, if Miami had Medici's, um, they would be uh, ensconced in, in, in pink. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just to give a, a sense of why Miami came of the age in the 80s. So these buildings, these Art Deco buildings that everyone knows from the 1930s, were actually nothing special when they were built. They went, no one loved them for many years went into disrepair until the late 1970s. They were kind of rediscovered, uh, kind of uh, saved from demolition, and, and really became em the emblematic icons of Miami that they are now. So even though they're from the 30s, they are really from the 1980s. There are many charts that my students found that look like this, where basically everything is kind of going along fine until 1980, and so Cuban, Cuban immigration, the boat, the famous boat people, all happened throughout the, the 1980s. South American banks, uh, you know, got nervous about being based in South America and decided to move uh, to somewhere closer to the U.S., so they moved to Miami. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, cocaine came of uh, wide use in, uh, around the 1980s, and the cocaine trade was centered in Miami. During the 1980s, there were a string of seven number one hits by a band called Miami Sound Machine. The Miami Dolphins uh, had their best seasons, uh, and all, both uh, uh, universities also had incredible sports seasons throughout the 1980s, and the number one television show, as we've already seen uh, in the United States, was Miami Vice. So it's a kind of amazing combination, and I think the 80s are a funny decade to make fun of. Miami Vice, uh, in fact, opened its montage every season. Um, this changed, actually, there was only one season that was always pink. Every year the, the color was different behind. Um, but it was never beige. Uh, and it, 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 the opening montage featured this building by Architectonica, which was a firm that also was founded in the 1980s and actually became uh, a kind of emblematic architectural uh, uh, embodiment of everything that was Miami and exciting in that period, and this building was really, you know, part of the, Don Johnson's name appeared, I think, over this building in the, in the opening montage. I think what is interesting, though, about this is the 80s is a very shallow decade in some ways. It's, a, it's, a, an, an, uh, it's about pop culture, and it's really the beginning of the, the shallowness that we all live with today. But at the same time, you know, there was a lot going on then. And I think these buildings also are a bit caricaturesque, but, um, but certainly different than the postmodern buildings that were happening um, uh, at the same time in architecture. And I think, for me, this is, an, this is Architectonica's best building. It's the Babylon, which is also about to be torn down. No, no. Hopefully not being torn down. It got protection. Ah, it's an amazing building. I mean, you can see it's the, the facade with then this kind of Corbusian um, apartment building behind. Um, a really beautiful project, and I think for me, this, these kind of projects always reminded me of other work of the 1980s. You know, not Miami Vice, but really the 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 kind of intellectual postmodernism of Omar Oem Ungers or or Satsas and the Memphis Group. Um, so for me, it's th this the result of the research project was just to discover that all this kind of. Uh, coming together, uh, coming of age of Miami in the 1980s, but also this theme which you have seen in basically every presentation, which is that what on the surface in Miami looks shallow and, and uh, uh, you know, surface deep actually has a kind of incredible depth, uh, a, a non-US sophistication kind of behind it. Uh, and I think th this research was done after our design for the Miami Garage, but that is the kind of theme of our project as well, as a kind of uh, some seemingly shallow project with surprising depth, uh, which I think you could say about many of the things that we, we looked at. So I didn't. I thought Terry was going to present his project. So we, I'm actually not presenting the full project. We are only one fifth of a project, uh, which was also a parking garage on this site in Miami, and it is not our project. This is Terry Riley's project. Uh, he basically had the idea to invite five architects to tell them. I guess we were told who each other were, uh, but we weren't. Told, we were told not to tell anyone else what we were doing and to design one-fifth of a parking garage facade uh, and, they, and then we would be kind of randomly uh, put together. So, and I'll show some images of that in a second, but our, our one-fifth is here. Uh, as Hillary mentioned, uh, in Miami you are given three feet to work with 
uh, that is the official Miami dimension. Uh, so they said that we could project uh, our facade in or out three feet, uh, or actually I think in the end we were giving three foot six, um, in or out of the, of, the, of the surface of the building. And so we thought, well that's, you know, it's already a, a shallow uh, place to work, uh, a kind of shallow project as a parking garage, because in the future hopefully we're not parking so much. Uh, and, uh, and that's a very shallow depth. So we said, okay, let's do the deepest possible program, at least. Um, so within our three feet, we proposed to put everything from an auditorium to a park, to a children's uh, playground, to a lending library, a DJ booth, uh, a kind of water collection system, pet stations, electric car uh, charging places, an art gallery, a kind of sculpture gallery, a painting gallery, uh, along with the places to sit, uh, to put as much circulation on the facade as, uh, as possible, to just kind of stuff it with as much stuff to make Miami, uh, this, 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 to kind of create a vertical city in a way, uh, a kind of city that, that, that Miami wants to be or is secretly, let's say. We did a bunch of tests of what this could look like and eventually came up with the idea of a kind of ant farm so that all of this activity would be uh, either displayed or, or concealed uh, at different moments to kind of create this also visual representation of this kind of verticalization of, of activity and, and life throughout this very thin building. And this is what the model looked like. Uh, we have the problem in our office of making models that look exactly like the building, so there will be no surprise what the building looks like. So this is the kind of outside of it with this carved, and then inside you have all these different um, spaces and activities. Um, so that's what we were designed, and then we were told what site we had and who was next to us. Uh, so we secretly worked with Jürgen Meyer and, and realized that he had a kind of similar finger scheme at the corner, and I think corners are, I guess, another uh, uh, theme of today and the, the theme of uh, 500 years of architecture, um, but uh, uh, you know, so we work together to kind of uh, keep, you know make our fingers uh, interact in, in an interesting way at, at the corner. And so this is uh, our facade interacting with Jurgens. As you turn the corner, I you know it it gets gets crazy over there, uh, <laughs> but pretty interesting. Uh, you know, it's Instagram. Uh, and, uh, and, and here are some images of our project. So we, we did take Don Johnson's famous t-shirt as our uh, color weight for the, the interior. Here you can see the, the, the four feet, uh, three, three and a half feet that we were given, um, and some of the different images. So in, in a way, all this different stuff behind, um, we thought by if we just paint it all pink, it, you know, it will create a kind of coherence inside. So you have this kind of pink zone on the, on the, on the inside. Here's the kids' playground under construction. Uh, the, the auditorium at the top, uh, and you can see the DJ booth at the top. What's amazing is that, you know, because the cars need to breathe, uh, Miami, uh, you know, hates parking garages, but they build lots of them, and so the city is kind of always telling you, you have to cover up parking garages, but then they're also saying you have to make them completely transparent, so, uh, because, the, the, to get the fumes out. So it was great to work with perforated metal on this. Uh, so that the building actually completely transforms and at night you, you don't read the kind of ant farm facade but you actually read the, the deeper um, part of the ant farm all the way back to the, to the parking garage. Um, and that is that. One of, the, one of the highlights of my professional career would be going down to the building department to try to explain this project. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, just for the record, so you see there's um, Jürgen Meyer, there's, the, there's this French artist, uh, uh, Nic Nicolas Bouff, uh, who uh, does set design for the Paris Opera, and lots of 2D work, and he's fascinated by uh, Rococo architecture and manga, so it's a kind of mashup. Uh, this is Clavel Rojo's, uh, Facade. It's called Urban Jam. It's car bodies attached to the facade. Uh, the donor to the museum across the street is a, is a car dealer. So it's uh, silver and gold cars. Uh, and this at the end is ours. And it's, um, you know, <coughs> Miami's under construction uh, all the time. There's a company called Bob's Barricades. And they provi provide all the yellow, the orange and white striped <laughs> stuff. So that whole thing is an homage to um, Bob's Barricades. So I remember the time I'm in the building department, 
explaining that there's a children's playground, there's an art gallery, there, what else? A library. <laughs> a library. And they're also looking at me like, you're gonna, you have to have a mixed use permit. This is gonna have to be a, a place of assembly. How many people are you gonna have in your auditorium? So, it, a massive relabeling job. <laughs> now, what you can't see in this picture is uh, these 24 foot caryatids with little manga faces that are holding the entrance to the garage. It took about two months, but every inspector in the building department knows how to say caryatids. <laughs> so, anyway, um, are you all going to come up here to sit? I'd like to tease out a thread that popped in and out of a couple of presentations. Uh, the mention of Tony Goldman. Tony, Tony Goldman was a real estate developer. He passed away a couple years ago. And he has his roots in Soho. Actually, initially Philadelphia. I don't know which neighborhood. But then Soho, South Beach, and then uh, West Windwood. Windwood. And he had a very uh, clear vision. You buy up cheap properties in rundown neighborhoods that have certain assets. And you then do little things to make it, make it cool, make it attractive, get a restaurant to move in. Then, <laughs> then there's a moment where it all starts to work. And it's not you investing all your money, it's all these other people coming in, buying it, the property next door, uh, renovating it, so on and so forth. Um, this got repeated in, like I said, Soho, uh, South Beach, Winwood, Winwood and, um, and, and Craig does it in the design district. He's doing more construction, but it's also because he has a very substantial partner there. Uh, he always intended it to be the design district where it would be uh, furniture shops and so on. Uh, he got approached by LVMH looking for that sort of an arrangement, like a, almost like a, what's the place in Rodeo Drive where it's not really a mall, it's a, a walking space. So that's sort of interesting and if anybody has any <coughs> recollections of him that would be interesting to hear it. Um, South Beach. Uh, South Beach was always a cheap American destination. It was, it was family, uh, those uh, unbelievably inexpensive little concrete boxes. Uh, it was never a luxury, it was never upscale. Uh, that uh, led to its decline in the end. It wasn't funded enough to maintain its um, uh, attractiveness. And the cruise ship line business was beginning to put the motels out of business. So there's another link in, in these things. Um, and I guess there's many other links. But I, I wanted to correct, somebody gave a demographic. Um, uh, more than half of Miamians are Latin, but only half of them are Cuban. Okay? So it's. Uh, Venezuelans, Hondurans, so whatever, uh, make up the rest. Um, blacks, I think, make up 10%, 15% of the population. And the rest are called Anglos. So if you're from Poland, you're an Anglo. If you're from uh, Samoa, you're an Anglo. And uh, it, it has a very curious uh, flavor like that. I mean, it's a little bit Beirut. But, you know, there's just like these major distinctions and pockets of population. Um, I don't have any questions to start off with. Are there any observations? I think that uh, Dade County is probably in the U.S. I, I, because you touched upon the statistics thing, is the one that has the highest concentration of foreign-born, yeah. something like that. It's like. 90 percent, you know, and it's, it's when you do business in Miami, it's very funny because um, you know you're thrown into a room with six, seven people, and uh, the language might be Spanish. Nobody asks 
the guy sitting on the left or on the right, if he knows Spanish, they just talk speak Spanish. So it can be very intimidating in a way, you know, to, 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 to do business there because it's like very foreign. Uh, but at the same time, it's uh, very alluring, you know? It's, all, it's, it's really happening. It is a neighborhood thing, um, and how people get to the United States, get to Miami, uh, will also color your perception of them. Uh, when I was the director of the Miami Art Museum, uh, I was surprised and I brought up to the board that none of our materials were bilingual. And the heavy hitting Latin trustees said, we don't want them to be bi bilingual. Everybody should learn English. And this conversation would not take place in Texas. It would not take place in California. But um, so, yes, a lot of them were refugees. A lot of them came here to study, and they're very proud of their ability to speak both languages. And they were simply not that interested in having bilingual uh, material. Um, What's the first time you went to Florida? Uh, I went uh, my freshman year of college mm -hmm. to. Uh, uh oh. <laughs> 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 yep. I drove down with a friend of mine. We drove all night long, and uh, we were so tired. We hit Fort Lauderdale. We were kind of delirious from tiredness, and I guess driving a little bad. We got pulled over by police. And uh, they said, we're not going to give you a ticket, but you have to leave Dade County and never, or Broward County, it was Broward County, County. and never come back. <laughs> <laughs> and so they kicked us out of Broward County. So then, yeah, we went down to Dade County. So we fell asleep on the beach. <laughs> so, uh, but you were, did you have any architectural vision? Uh, no, I did see, I saw Morris Day perform at the beach. <laughs> Jungle Love. <laughs> no architectural no, no, no. I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to get to is who has an actual rolling memory of what I saw at that time and what I no, figured I, out. Yeah, and then later I went, I remember the, the Raquel building was very, uh, I, I went there to row crew the next year um, and we would run past that building and everybody, you know, that was, it was Miami. The Canards? The one with the hole. I'm Brick Brickell. Brickell. Oh, right. Brickell. 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 Yeah, Brickell. Yeah, I know. That's when uh, postmodernism was, you know, that's, that's when Phil Johnson was on the cover of Time Magazine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we got there in the early 90s to Miami, and um, I sort of uh, felt there was a huge contrast coming from New York, also me being German, and I remember here at Columbia, we we had all this discussion, what is real? You know, what's the real, what's the reality? And I came to Miami, I said, this is the future. Because this is not real. <laughs> and I was actually fascinated. I thought, you know, actually, we, well, we got there because Gustavo got a job with architect Tony Terry, the Latin. There, was, there were opportunities, we really felt that. And it took just really long, really long. And Miami changed, and or maybe the world changed. I don't know. So the two things come together, and it's amazing. All these projects are coming up, and also sort of the the character of those projects. You know, I, I actually think that um, all the projects you showed from Miami. I mean, that we are, uh, you know, all the Pritzker Vice winner uh, winner uh, built there, and I think they did, built amazing projects. And, and also that what is going on with the design district, you know, well, it, why there are so many cars, it's because Miami is a city of cars, we all drive, but there is a great energy in, in it, and it will, ch and it's changing in a, in a really interesting way, and in a contemporary way. You know, I remember asking Sarah, you know, because Sarah uh, uh, chose to have her place be Miami, she could have lived anywhere. And, uh, and actually, when she was not in London, she, Miami was her place. So, Saka, why is it so strange? Suddenly, you choose this place. And it was not that she was seeking work here. 
Right. Right. She liked to hang out. There. In fact, I think she was escaping from her office by coming to Miami, staying at the which one? At the at the Setai. Well, the one she wanted. At, at originally the rally. Yeah. Many years ago. And then the other architects who I mean, had the same kind of feel for Miami Beach in the 80, you know, the grittier moments were Herzog and Young. Yeah. And they used to come here from, uh, Jacques and his wife used to come here uh, to hang out, you know, and uh, uh, it's odd that they both wound up being major contributors yeah. um, without actually intending to be. Well, and Rand and Lorenzo Spear did a project together in Miami before Architect Annika, right? The Pink House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Rand? Lorenzo Spear. Rand and Lorenzo Spear did a project for her parents. Yeah, the Pink House. And that, no, the Pink House. Lorenzo Spear. Oh, okay. There's two distinct de designs. Yeah. The Pink House I, was built, I believe, in. I can't remember when, but it is bright pink and it's right on the bay, right? Yes. And I don't know what Christo would say if you asked him, where'd you get the idea for the mm. colored pink? Because <laughs> all those islands are within sight of the house. Yeah, that's true. I think he mentioned the color of the water that he wanted to do the contrast to the... Christo. Yeah, Christo. That, that's why he chose pink. <laughs> I just came back from my... <coughs> I really enjoyed the weather here. Yeah. It was sweltering hot. But I did see the design uh, district and I was really uh, impressed with all these colors. The parking project that you did was, was very um, very inspiring. What would you say is missing in the design district? Well, there's a Jean Gang tower that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, that's just a personal preference. Um, I think, quite frankly, uh, did you take a taxi from the design district to the airport? No, 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 I drove. I see. Well, the design district is five minutes from the airport, and it's five minutes to <coughs> South Beach. Um, I would think it, it would be an interesting place to uh, stay if you were uh, for business or holiday or whatever, and a few more restaurants, I think. Like hospitality, right? Like what? Like the hospitality for Yes. Yeah. Because all that, the luxury stores and uh, art galleries and amazing objects and architecture, it seems something is missing <coughs> after hours. I mean, it's still early days. They're, they're planning out a whole uh, kind of um, phase to fill it in with with life, with restaurants and, and other cafes and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's still in a kind of constant kind of growing into its shoes. I have to say, I mean, I was, um, was kind of struck uh, by all our presentations, uh, this theme of uh, kind of relinquishing to the forces of Miami, whether it's the, the warm sun or the uh, three foot which, by the way, we got two feet, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you were, uh, you, we got like 12 inches. You got, yeah, you got less. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I get every building gets a kind of, but, yeah, or every developer. Yeah, really hey, we got one millimeter, I was telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but there seemed to be this theme of, um, of, um, of, of accepting uh, what, what you're given and, and making the most of it uh, down there. Um, I mean, I definitely feel like we've, learn from that ethic into all our other projects. So, you know, you, it almost seems like every project you're doing is about, you know, making the most of, of what, um, what a client or a developer might give you. Um, but I feel like it, it plays, it, it plays itself, it, at least today, it, that theme played itself out rather, uh, rather starkly. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? Do um, you think this coping thing that you're talking about has something to do with the environment, you know, with the water on all sides, and this like sort of ticking time bomb? <laughs> <laughs> well here, uh, I'll give you a little, right now, um, uh, you know, we, we now have a form-based building code, zoning and building code, done by 
new, uh, new urbanist, um, our former new urbanist dean. And I'm trying to remember, the work started out in 2000. I think it took five years to uh, ratify it. Uh, it has now one word in it about climate change. And uh, maybe in 2005, that's a little understandable. Um, the other thing, the other document is the city's uh, uh, preservation policy. Uh, and it makes no distinction of whether a property is on a site that's technically below water, or will be soon. Uh, you know, no hydro, hydro, what's that? When you map the water, hydro, map of water <laughs> areas over it. I mean, and we have a state building code that um, was adopted by the IEC or one of these national codes. It has a bigger section on snow loads than it does on, on rising water. Um, uh, it, is, it is being taken seriously in discussions yeah, in, you know, and amongst bankers, insurers, property holders, and so on and so forth. Um, well, you know, I think that uh, progress has to be made, you know, and how to deal with this. Uh, once the insurance companies start turning down uh, policies or raising them to unsustainable rates, you're in trouble. Now, the, uh, the entire county is not all at risk. Uh, a big part of the state is. Yeah, design is actually on high ground. Yeah, we're, gonna, yeah. we're seven feet above. Yeah. No, it's interesting though, I mean, to, to, to just to play off that, I mean, uh, the concentration on the envelope in Miami is not a vanity exercise. It's, it's uh, the, the hurricane um, laws are so, are so stringent. Um, we all had to deal with the, um, um, uh, with, I mean, they're, they're amazing. Your building has to pass what's called a missile test, which doesn't happen here. Uh, literally, your, your material has to, has to stop a, uh, the missile test is a, is a two by four that they shoot at your material at 120 miles an hour to simulate uh, a palm tree hitting your building and, and, and you have your, your, your facade, it has to withstand that. So that's a design constraint that like, you know, all of us, I mean, implicitly we all have to pass missile tests. <laughs> so you, you, you wonder why, you know, why, why this, you know, why this attention to just that few inches like well, that's one reason, and you know the climate is so extreme. You really have to mitigate uh, climate for comfort, and now you have the added, uh, the added uh, uh, rising water. Because there's no mandate at uh, state level for considering uh, sea level rise and things like that. In fact, certain government agencies have been precluded from discussing this. Uh, Legally, they cannot talk about it. So then it, it comes down to the municipalities. Um, and uh, Miami Beach is trying to make themselves be proactive, right? And so it, you have villages, you have these pockets of things happening, but it's within themselves. It's not a statewide conversation. And therefore, it's much more difficult because a city like in Miami Beach may or may not have the funds to attack bigger questions. Um, but, since we are speaking of Miami Beach, they are now elevating. They understand that the whole city over the next 10, 15 years have to elevate four feet. So if you go there now and you drive one of the main arteries, which is West Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, or it, you know the streets on the back, you go up and down and up and down, because any, any of the new constructions, uh, roadways and uh, civil projects are elevated five feet. And there's a huge issue with that because the retail stores that are immediately to the side of it are sunken. Mm -hmm. And so it, when we design new buildings in Miami Beach, they allow us, for example, an extra four feet of height, understanding that if the city ever decides to build up, uh, you will be taken, or whoever the owner is, four feet of, of your property and elevated. So, you know, these, these things are, are ongoing. 
guess I was curious about the aesthetics, you know, because I, I'm familiar with a lot of this regulation conversation, but does this kind of living at the edge of disaster, you know, have an influence, not just now, yes, but like in the history of Miami, mm -hmm. like the, the pink, the shades of pink and the... Well, now it has because what was mentioned before, the hurricane compliance, which means uh, that any element that you use to for the design of a facade or, or a roof or a door, things that is outside on the shell, needs to have a hurricane approval. And it's very expensive to design uh, your own element to be approved by hurricane because you will have bear the brunt of that testing. So uh, architects are uh, limited to use what is there in the market most of the time. And therefore, a lot of the architecture starts to look the same. Yeah, because we have to use what is pre-approved, let's say. And it's great, you know, with like architects that you see here today that are trying to break that and incorporate other uh, uh, systems that are far beyond what we normally utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I think, I mean, uh, I don't think it's disaster so much, the aesthetics. I, I mean, what we did when we did our research, it's, it's fantasy. You know, it's always associated with fantasy. And I think, and it's the combination of uh, this fantasy of being at the beach, being outside of your normal day-to-day -day life. It was always vacation land. Um, Disney, you know, it, it's dreamland. Uh, uh, I think combined with the fact that it's all very new and there is no history to draw on. I think, you know, Art Deco is really a European uh, phenomenon. It was the first modern international style, but it's not, you know, it's New York and it's, uh, and it's Miami, you know, that's where it caught on in the U.S. and then the rest of the world. Uh, so I think, you know, there's something about that it was always a modern, forward-looking city that was, you know, heavily projecting this idea of the future, I would say, I think, uh, and, and, and this kind of life, life that is not day-to-day -day life, not serious life. So. That's why that was our reason. <laughs> yeah, I think my 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 well, going back to the question of what were your impressions of Miami and, and having this almost kind of generational. My my first experience in Miami was the design for the uh, art fair, and so when I yeah when I think of Miami, I think of interiors, which is kind of ironic. And um, so in my mind, there's like the giant art fair interior tents, and then there's the design district. Um, which is almost like this weird uh, urban interior as well, even though it's outside. But um, it also, I mean, I think the conversation about the development too, uh, and these kind of pockets of um, development that might occur, kind of like makes me think of this kind of future archipelago um, that might kind of evolve from where it's at. I guess my question is, how do you see uh, the development patterns shifting? I mean, I think the Prez is sort of an interesting uh, example, right, because that's sort of positioned more inland and you, you, I don't know why it was positioned there, but um, you see things moving obviously more inland. And uh, what's referred to it as the, the Biscayne Corridor is the growth of the city north from downtown up uh, to uh, uh, further northern uh, reaches. And uh, that has re received a lot of attention from developers. I don't know how these guys get together and decide where they're going to build the next tower. Um, but uh, this is not about Miami Beach. This is on the Miami side. And this is not about second, any second homes. Um, so it's uh, a more familiar development pattern. Um, I expect there to be very few empty blocks, you know, within the next 15 or 20 years. Miami has a huge um, housing deficit in terms of decent, uh, decent middle class, if working force class. So um, yes, it does seem to be a lot of, a lot of, a big, it's a big pipeline. The other interesting thing about Miami is it's not a sprawling. Everyone drives, but it's not a sprawling mm. city. It's camped it in uh, by the wetlands to the west and the ocean to the east. Mm. And it's combined with a fairly progressive 
uh, urban growth boundary, uh, which it came about in the 1970s, and it's still there. It, it's like Oregon and Miami. It, like they have the urban growth boundaries in the U.S. Uh, and so I think you know that it's becoming denser and denser and denser. The subway's never going to come. The, the, the limestone, John, there, but you know, but it'll be interesting to see you know, how that plays out. How do you think about the tensions between regeneration and gentrification, and the fact that some of these new spaces are becoming very exclusive? <laughs> well, you know, in Miami, um, like the, the design district has not been gentrified in the sense that no one's really been displaced. It was really down at the heels, uh, former uh, design area, and uh, and the same with Win Westwood, Winwood. Mm -hmm. um, again, very down at the heels, empty buildings. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of a neighborhood that is gentrifying in that sense that we use it. Well, Miami Beach has gone through a gentrification. Lincoln Road and. Little yes, Haiti I guess from so. the, from the, I mean, Little Haiti. Little Haiti, yes. That's two big projects right now. Yes. Um, and if you develop it there, it's tapping up land, and they see the future. That's going to be the Biscayne Corridor all the way. I, um, I, was, I was wondering, actually, I, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that it's this kind of very weird mix between uh, there is some history, there's strong culture, it's pretty tribal. Um, you have some codes and regulation, it's very developer driven, but, but at the same time compared to uh, it succeeded, there's a kind of consistency and mm. things are nevertheless within the anarchy <laughs> yielding something that has a kind of coherence which you don't find in other cities that are just market-driven and uh, um, just... So I, I don't know what all these... You were saying, like, you don't know how they get together and decide. So yeah. it's so interesting that they would actually get together. Or, yeah. like, what are these mechanisms of... Um, there's, there's one part, and the second part, has the design, design district become a model, do people call Craig Robbins up, say, hey, we want you to consult, we're trying to start up X, Y, and Z, or, or is it not there yet, or? You know, I think they've got to finish it first. Okay. I mean, there's still stuff in construction, and ladies who are in high heels and are shopping for a $5,000 purse don't like construction dirt. Um, the, uh, what was the first part of the question? The kind of... Oh, yes. I, 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 I'm sure they don't get together. They don't share information. Secrecy is okay. unbelievably important. Right. Um, uh, well, the one thing that, along the lines of what you're saying, has always kind of um, puzzled me is if you look at downtown from the causeway, from the Miami Beach side, uh, it's got a really nice yeah. skyline. And of course, you get the water, and then the park, and then the skyline, and you know it's sort of like, how'd they do that? <laughs> but but, it, but you know it's funny because when we moved there, what, 20 years ago, you could only design a building that would be yellow or peach, and if it was something with a roof, it had to have like this uh, barrel vault tile, right? So it was like an extension of coral gables. Um, you know, fast forward 20 years, and that has radically changed. And I, I think Art Basel had a lot to do with that. Another layer is that Latin American countries has gone through this up and down, and people who were uh, had their industries in Colombia, so got fed up with the situation there, and decided to make, uh, this is my theory, make Miami their home. They still have their companies there and their lieutenants, but they moved to Miami. And these are people from globalized, right? And they expect a certain level of services. They expect a museum of certain quality. They expect a performing arts center. They expect banking institutions. And they're sophisticated. And they've been pushing to develop very fast Miami. And it's not by chance that, that you have a, a, a Paris donating 
right? Mm -hmm. This enormous amount of money, and, right. and likewise, other people like that, that in 20 years completely transformed the equation. But Dallas is the same, but it doesn't have, I mean, you have people pushing for an arts district and a performance arts center, and it, 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 it but, doesn't... But don't forget, up until some yeah. measurable time, Cubans thought they were all going back to Cuba. They're not going to build museums in Florida, they're not going to build concert halls. They thought that they were going back to Cuba. So that has done a big change. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering whether the urban growth boundary also helps, yes, like also cre does. create density, does. or or you know where you can like in Dallas, they, you know developers mm -hmm. keep going mm -hmm. out and out and out and yeah. out, so you can never create a sense of uh, you know compression. No, that's absolutely true. I think that in some ways it goes. I'm Floridian, and I think in some ways it goes back to what Dan was saying about the idea of the fantasy land. Like if you go to Seaside, which was built by the New Orleans, like it's a town that was created, right? And there's like this very specific vernacular, but also most places on the Gulf Coast, at least, um, in Tampa Bay, places like Holiday, Florida, um, were created as towns at a time when vacationing became possible for the middle class, and Miami really had a, a pull together at that time, too. I mean, it's like, in the town that I grew up in, you were either Latin American or you were from Michigan, Pennsylvania, or New York. <laughs> and like it really, and so there's this thing that happens in Florida where every 30 years when the popular style changes, they just pick up literally the store's clothes and then they build another one down the street. And the interesting thing, so I think that because in many ways Miami can't do that, and the land is more valuable, it's more beautiful, because they can't just like move more down the Gulf Coast because of the protected lands of the Everglades, because of the desire to stay close to um, you know, Caribbean and like Gulf sort of islands. There is a sense of place there that I think has not necessarily gelled in other cities. Um, in Florida specifically, but if you look at like Tampa as an example, lots of the development in Tampa around um, like Cigar City, like the like mm -hmm. Cuban areas, like maintaining those spaces, the new buildings that are being built are being built in that vernacular because there is a desire for a sense of community that I think even irrespective of like outside influence, there's a desire to keep things sort of looking the same, which I think is why everything is peach and pink or yellow or whatever. It's the same reason why like when you buy a house and the entire street is all bright colors, like even if you wouldn't necessarily choose that for yourself, like people sort of, they, they want a sense of community. And I think it's because there is so, because everyone is sort of far from home, they want to create an identity with that place that is specific. Like, my house in Miami has these things, whereas like my house in Rhode Island has like a very different sort of aesthetic and thought. And I think that that is kind of how these ideas or these like spaces kind of congeal and like, we kind of want this to look like that because we want to maintain this feeling. And it is very much like the Disney idea. No one who's building in Miami wants the postcard of like, Welcome to Miami to look different than it does already because it adds to like sort of the value of the uh, like allure of the place. And I think that that's just sort of a like the vacation understanding of that aesthetic of Florida. I would, I would yeah, that's really interesting. Um, are you okay? Well, I would just add that there's probably two different kinds of like fantasy land or two, you know, one is like the celebration or the, the kind of Disney fantasy has. Um, you know, a high degree of control and, and regulation and, um, and, and rules to really carry that out. I mean, certainly celebration, uh, you know, it's like building a New York. Um, whereas, you know, some of these other, I would say, developments, probably the kind of wilderness aspect of it or wildness has, has to do with their, that there are these kind of rough scenes that people do really, I mean, I think all of us were really trying to push these regulations that we were dealt with, certainly Miami Code and the new Miami Code, um, you know, we were able to do this corner treatment on this building that we showed um, because we we maximized our interpretation of, of one aspect of the code, where which was the requirement for a 
I mean, just real quickly, like a visit, you have to have visibility around corners. <coughs> so the new Miami code says you have to have all rounded corners, which is kind of crazy. Um, so we, we said, well, it's not quite rounded, but it does give you visibility. And, you know, it's that, it's that interpretation that I think brings in some, like, that's where architects kind of can step in and, and, and put their dream. But it's very different from, say, like celebration or, or a kind of Disney town. I think there's different, there's ways you can parse that idea of, of fantasy. I was just going to say, I mean, I think the, the one thing is that we felt most struck by was just the client's dedication to design. And that, Absolutely. you know, that, yeah. that, that's almost yeah. unprecedented in a way. The, you know, it's not to say we had free reign over anything. Yeah. I mean, we use very simple uh, materials. But it's the design the district. It has to be. Not, yeah. Well, it does. <laughs> it does. But, but he's mean, kind of personalized it. His yeah. home. He's home in New York. His home in Miami. Yeah. He's, he's very serious about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think a total dedication <clears throat> to that. And, and have you seen and, uh, that? Have you sorry, seen can I just finish my sorry, sorry. thought? I mean, I, I think that that it just shouldn't be undervalued, right? And design is. You know, there's many definitions to what that is, and to the extent of it. And I think that there is always, our experience was that at all levels, and whoever we dealt with was about reinforcing that degree of, of detail. So I think even across all the presentations, you know, the kind of questioning of the surface yeah. from one millimeter to, you know, the idea of the corner, um, I think those are, are valuable lessons for students to understand how to engage in something mm -hmm. on a small scale, even if it's a big city. It's definitely the prototype. Have you seen other parts of uh, America attempting that kind of master plan with a design focus? Well, Rodeo Drive just happened to be a street in Beverly Hills where all the fancy uh, luxury brands wrote, wrote, uh, moved to. Um, uh, I noticed that uh, some time ago they tried to do what looked like a side street off of it. But it was extremely um, stage set looking. You know, it didn't, it feel, felt like you had left the urban core. You know, in this instance, these are all the original streets. They're all the original uh, sidewalk widths for better or for worse. Um, most of the buildings, what, was your building from scratch? Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, we, we've done two from scratch, but a number of these buildings have been redone uh, partially or completely as uh, existing fabric. Uh, there are a couple of historic buildings. There's um, the brick Moore building. Um, he was the pioneer who developed that whole area in the 1920s. Um, he figured since he was going to uh, subdivide this place and build houses, he should open up uh, a furniture company so that people could fill up their houses with uh, his furniture. Uh, the, uh, hmm. yeah. yeah, I would, I mean, sorry, I just wanted to um, uh, reinforce um, this. They, they really do know what they're talking about with design, and, and I think it's partly this exposure to an international um, um, client base and, and, and kind of the, the Art Basel gallery scene there. They, uh, as, a, as a developer and, and increasingly I think the community in, uh, at large in Miami is, is just very aware of what's happening everywhere else. More, more we were finding they were more aware than, 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 than we were here in the East Coast of say, what's, what's the best gallery in Antwerp? Like they knew. Uh, they had an, they had an opinion about it, they, and and I think that 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 idea of of, of you know having an informed uh, like an informed uh, uh, um, collaborator was 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 critical, and um, and yeah, I, I would back that up. I, I've been you know there's there's one story about Miami that's um, for for myself like ten years is I've, I've always um, you have to be careful. Uh, Underestimating Miami, uh, it, it's a uh, it's a town that that, that knows. 
But that also changed in the last 10 years. People who live in Miami, who stay now, these global jet setters, you know, that have yeah. art collection, they live in Miami. They change also the nature of what architecture is in Miami. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, I'm, from, I'm from Ecuador. Uh, the, the influence of Miami on South America is something that's really interesting. You know, South Americans see Miami as a, as a as basically they, it's, it's the United States for them. Like, you know, when they say we're going to go to the United States, it means they go to Miami and they see the culture of Miami as, as a completely like United States. So, that tells you something, right? <laughs> it, so then uh, uh, the, uh, and it seems like it, it's always a little bit behind too. It's like it's Miami maybe five years ago. So the, the, the influence of, of, of architecture that uh, has come to Miami is actually just starting to hit uh, South America, which is pretty interesting. I'm from Ecuador, and uh, we're, we just got, uh, in Quito, we have two uh, Georg Engel buildings and, uh, and a John Nobel, which is, which is never, which is never, you know, never, never, never happened. In fact, it is the first, the first time a uh, uh, start architect's kind of coming to Ecuador. And, it's, and it, I really think is like some of this uh, Miami thing. Wow. Well, I wanted to uh, thank every, everyone. Like, every time we have an event such as this, I'm, I'm kind of going through my head. Going, this could be like a whole day you know, discussion of design in cities, but also uh, I hope there are some real estate students here. I'm not sure. Yay. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, great. Um, and uh, so thanks, everyone. It was really um, interesting. Thank you, especially Terry. And I'm going to make sure to get you back soon. Okay. Thank you.